Brothers and sisters, thanks so much for being with me. Our last episode, if you didn't catch it, you need to watch it before you watch this one. I talked about what's going on in the world, what's wrong with the world right now, why is the world rejecting faith, gave some helpful insights, and how we're supposed to respond to that. But a lot of our high ideals go nowhere unless they translate to practical realities. Realities that are so stupidly simple they leave you saying, duh, to which I would say, duh, so do them. Right? Uh, so often, the difference between a life we know we're supposed to live and a life we're living comes down to stupidly simple things that we don't make time for because what's urgent crowds out what's important in life. I'm going to talk about the importance of you sharing your faith, of, of embracing the apostolic option, being like the apostles who ran into the world joyfully despite the fact that they knew it could have and eventually did kill them because <laughs> the world wanted the faith less and less. And the world today... It, 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 a lot of people just can't stand Christianity. And we're supposed to jump into the mess with love and with joy, just like the apostles did. Today, we're going to talk about how to. Thanks for being with me. How do you share the faith like the apostles? I'm going to give you five tips, five rules to live by. Are you ready? Take your pens. I want you to take some notes. I want you to actually do the things that I'm going to lay out today. Number one, keep first things first. I know you're watching and I can't hear you, but I'd like you to say it out loud right now. Keep first things first. Okay. J uh, uh, C.S. Lewis said, put first things first, get second things thrown in. Put second things first, lose both first and second things. Isn't this true with everything in life? If you're running a business, you've got to keep first things first. What's your business about? There's a lot of details that come from what the business, the core business is about. If you get lost in all the details, you lose the core thing and then all the rest crumbles. Married life is the same thing. At the end of the day, marriage is about this exchange of hearts you had when you exchange vows in front of an altar in a church full of people. And there's a zillion details that come from that exchange of hearts and vows. But if you get lost in the details and forget why you did this, why you're doing all these details, what all this is about, everything crumbles. Your faith is like that. Pope Francis said, we're in the midst of a love story. If we don't understand that, we've understood nothing of what the church is. Just like marriage, this is a love story. You forget the love story, what are you left with? I gave a talk about this at a church recently and an old guy in the front row said, a to-do list. <laughs> you get to give up all your closet space. You get to report to someone every three hours for the rest of your life about where you are. You get to have kids that suck all the life out of you. My parents are so boring. That's because of you, kids. They were cool before you. <laughs> If, however, you put the love story back, every detail starts to make sense. We need to keep first things first as Catholics, and as we share the faith with the world, the thing we should lead with is, this is a love story. This is about the love of God for you. That he's given himself to you, and he's calling you to give yourself back to him. This whole thing is contained in and explodes from John 3.16. For God so loved the world, so loved you, that he gave his only son, that whoever should believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Let me tease this out a little and spell out what this love story is, this, this core message of our faith, this foundation of everything in Scripture, everything in, in Christian life, all the smells, the bells, the incense, the church history, the doctrines, the dogma, all the stuff. It all comes from this core message, this simple story that there is a God, but this is very good news. You know why? Because the fact that there is a God is what shows us that life has purpose. I live in Denver. I was driving down the 25 freeway recently. I saw a billboard that said the meaning of life is to make up your own meaning. No, it's not. And if you think it is, then you know that even if you made up something that sounds really cool, that what you've made up is nothing more than make-believe. That's kind of a depressing way to live. And in fact, it is depressing people. Gen Z is the least religious generation in history. It is also the most depressed, anxiety-ridden, unsure of themselves, self-loathing generation in history. And I'm not just making that up. This is well documented. And I think a, a huge part of the reason for that is that people don't have answers to their fundamental questions about the meaning of life. They're sitting down in front of counselors looking for answers to metaphysical problems. Doc, I just kind of feel like there's no inherent meaning and that I'm self-aware space sludge destined for nothingness. Uh, here's a pill. It's not going to work. 
And, and by the way, no shame to mental health issues. Sometimes it's someone's particular cross that's making them a great soul. I mean, that's your path to heaven and your path to sainthood. But I look at the statistics today, man. 2016 was the first year that Gen Z, the least religious generation in history, entered college. Over half of them self-reported as below average in mental health. Over half. When you have numbers that high, that's not all chemical imbalances in the brain. We have a crisis in hope, a poverty of purpose. We have the good news of the gospel to answer it. It's amazing how we're getting shy about this. How Christians are thinking, what's someone going to think about me? Guys, the world is literally dying for what you have. The good news that there's a God. The even better news that most of history has gotten it wrong, that God is not a cosmic jerk. Most people throughout history have been afraid of their idea of God, but that we have a God who is love. One of my dear friends was an atheist. I got to become his godfather. After many late nights talking to him about the faith, he said, Chris, I don't know if there's a God, but if there is, he's Catholic. Because I can't imagine him being less than the love that you say he is. You know, we'll have people today who tell us, like, I don't know, man, to me, the purpose of life is love. Or like, there's this cosmic energy in the universe that's all about love. And I just want to shout, like, guys, you know that is like 100% TM trademark, Jesus Christ? Nobody thought that. Nobody said that before Jesus. This is 100% Christian Catholic stuff that we believe in a God who revealed himself to be love. That's the only reason we've dared to think that. That this God who is love had a great plan for us. That heaven is described as a wedding banquet, a place where everyone is rejoicing in love forever, where everyone has a stupidly large smile on their face for all eternity. This is God's dream. This is his why. This is why he made the universe. That when we wandered from his plan, John 3.16, God so loved the world, so loved you, that he gave his only son. And that he invites us today to repent, believe the good news, follow him, be filled with his life, be united with his church, and bring his love to the world. This is literally the best news that mankind has ever, can ever, will ever receive. I mean, we could try to think up worldviews that compete, and there is no other faith, no other philosophy, no other steps to happiness outside this that remotely compare with this idea that there's this cosmic force of love that created you, wants you to be happy, and died for you so that you'd live in his eternal joy. Nothing compares with that. And we're cowering in fear? Fear of maybe being canceled? Fear of how they might label us hateful and bigoted because we actually think that God might have rules for how I'm supposed to act, especially with, with, with sexual ethics or whatever the heck it is that, that's bothering the person you're talking to. We cower and fear this. Guys, the world is dying to hear this. But outside this context, all things Christian crumble. It strikes people as a to-do list. Disjointed doctrines that have nothing to do with real life. Rituals that I do to keep grandma happy. And not only does faith not make sense when we're not constantly keeping first things first in our conversations about God. And I've seen this all over, all over social media. People get lost in the particular debates without ever mentioning the name Jesus. I was reading something from Cardinal Cantalamesa about this recently. And he said, finally, he's like, I follow social media debates. And it's, it's as if a man named Jesus never existed. We get lost in the particulars without drawing people back to the love story. Why do we have these rules within marriage? Oh yeah, because two people fell in love. Why do we have these rules within Christianity? Oh, because God loves us. I, I put a theology on tap on when I worked for the Archdiocese of Denver. And my bishop, Bishop Connolly, was an auxiliary bishop here at the time. He gave a talk about abortion and the guy started to heckle him. And my wife went up to this guy after the talk. I guess she wanted to get me into a fight. I don't know. And uh, we ended up actually having a great conversation about the church's logic when it comes to abortion. It went on for about an hour, but at the end of that hour, this guy said, you know, I just think my mom should have aborted me. And it struck me, here I am, trying to explain the logic of the church's teaching about life, when he has no idea that he has any value himself, that any life has any meaning or purpose whatsoever. Outside the context that is the love story, the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only does your faith not make sense, all of human existence becomes an absurdity. Let's start leading with this gospel. 
I give events all around, all around the world, uh, these reboot events. Actually, if you want to bring me out someday, look at reallifecatholic.com and you could apply to have one of those reboot events. We do a big outreach plan. We draw on full churches. Half the people are not regular churchgoers. And we invite people to make a decision for Jesus. Let me tell you what's tragic. As I talk about the core message of the gospel, the love of God for them, the invitation to, to, to make a, a choice that, Jesus, I want you as, as Savior, as Lord of my life. Every once in a while, someone says, man, you sound like a, like a Baptist. You don't sound Catholic. Dude, you don't know what Catholic is if you think that doesn't sound Catholic. <laughs> so many people have lost first things. We need to come back to that. We need to be known as the church of the gospel again, not the church of the issue again. Oh, don't get me wrong. We dive into the issues. We dive into the moral teachings. We dive into the doctrines, the dogmas, all this stuff. But we always have to draw it back to the why. First things first. That's number one. That's your rule. Number two, make friends. Do not be so busy doing churchy things that you don't make time for people. I was actually writing this talk in a coffee shop, and a woman came and sat next to me and started crying. And I almost said, uh, I'm writing a talk about Jesus. Would you please shut up? <laughs> I didn't do that. I had a conversation with her. I dropped my, my laptop. You know, I'm just like, close it. And she started talking about the stuff that she's going through, and uh, it turns out she was a Buddhist, and we, I prayed with her in the coffee shop. Probably your first time praying with a Christian. People come first. Friendship, human connection. Guys, it's not programs. The programs are great. It's not apps, though apps are great. I make programs, and you might be watching me on the Formed app right now. But the ordinary forum for conversion is friendship. It's friendship. That's the place where programs and apps help to actually convert people. The ordinary forum for evangelization is not Twitter. I'm not sure I've ever, ever seen, I, I've seen plenty of debates. I'm not sure I've ever seen someone actually have their mind changed about Jesus and following him, converting him because of a Twitter debate, right? It's friendship where the deal is sealed, where we bring in these resources and all this other stuff. And let, let me make this even simpler. Duh, stupidly simple. Small groups. And I just use a churchy word that may have scared some of you. Small groups. Sounds kind of cheesy. Do I have to sit around, I don't have a cup of tea and be knitting something while I have my small group with my friends? Small groups. Okay, I am in two different small groups. I meet once a month with three other guys and I meet once a month with me and my wife and three other couples. What is a small group? What's this look like? We ask the friendship forming question, how are you? Which might sound kind of funny, how stupidly obvious that is, but Guys, I'm looking at you right now. You can go fishing uh, for an entire weekend with a friend, come home, your wife says, how is he? And you say, how am I supposed to know? Uh, you're with him all weekend. Yeah, we were fishing. <laughs> all right? Take the time to ask the how are you question. And, and sometimes people get together and they have Bible studies and they never ask how are you. And we can have church communities with tons of different programs and studies. And guys, that's not actual Christian community. That's not making friends in Christ. You have to know and be known by other people. Do you have that kind of accountability where your spiritual friends, where you know the struggles your friends are going through, you can call them on? Because if you don't, if you're not that honest with people, I'll tell you what, man, no one is so strong that they can stand without other people to hold them up. God has designed us to need each other. We're made in the image and likeness of God who is a trinity of persons. We're made to be a communion of persons. He doesn't just save us one-on-one. -on -one. He saves us as a church. We ask, how are you? Then we might study some Catholic resource. And there's plenty of things out there. Then we ask, how can I pray for you? We rinse and repeat. Guys, it's, it's life-changing for me. It's a, it's a total necessity for my spiritual life. You know what else? It's church-changing. We're not aggressive in going out and getting other people to join our group. However, we'd be open. If some new family moved in town, and some new guy needed some support. If everybody's doing this and they're merely open... What happens? I'll tell you what happens. What happens is what happens in our non-denominational friends, churches, and ecclesial communities that are outgrowing Catholic churches, not because their preaching is great, but because their small groups are great and they're intentional about it. I may have shared this before. Saddleback Church in Southern California grew from 6,000 to 9,000 small groups during COVID. 6,000 to 9,000 small groups. Not because of everything happening from the pulpit, but because it caught on like a wildfire and everybody said, the front porch to Christianity, that's my house. I take ownership of this. I invite people to God through communion 
in my house. Not receiving Holy Communion, but community, right? And Acts of the Apostles talks about temple worship and gathering in the homes. It's that one-two punch. Somehow as Catholics, we've completely lost the, 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 the jab and we just kept the constant, you know, cross. That's it. You're not going to win. You're not going to win that way. Saddleback, by the way, they've had 50,000 baptisms since they opened the doors in the 1980s. And they have a different theology of baptism. But those always mark someone converting and giving their lives to the Lord in a different way. If not, their actual water baptism for the first and only time. Guys, this works. When we look at the decline of church membership, I think that if everybody started making this a, a, a regular part of how they do Christianity, we can change the world. It, we're not dead yet. Keep first things first. Make friendships the ordinary form for evangelization, for how you share your faith. Number three, do not let your fear come in the way. Courage is not an absence of that gut sense of fear. It's pushing through it anyway for a greater and higher cause. And every time you share the faith, there's going to be some fear because it's stepping out there, putting your neck on the line. You might make someone angry. You might get yelled at. You might get canceled. You might upset grandma. But you got to do it anyway. And it's awkward for me like it is for you. Not right now. Right now it would be super awkward if I didn't talk about Jesus. You just turn on like a Catholic YouTube or forum, whatever. You expect it. In my daily life, different story. One of the most awkward times I ever had sharing the faith. My wife's grandma was dying of pneumonia. She was 92 years old. And she was a wonderful old woman. But she never went to church. And she had told my wife years before that moment on her deathbed that she thought she'd end up in hell when she died. Now, I don't know what secret sin she was carrying around or guilt in her heart, but I was there at her, at her bedside, and I knew God sent me to that moment, and I had to say something. So I leaned in real close to her, and I screamed, Repent! <laughs> yeah, no, I did not do that. I, I didn't know what to say! So I got close to her, and I said, Florence, there was a thief crucified next to Jesus, and he never did anything good his whole life. But at the very end of his life, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. I said, that guy went to heaven that day, not because of what he had done, but because of what Jesus did for him on the cross. He said, that guy can be you. The next day, she was reconciled to God and received into the Catholic Church. And the day after that, she died. What if I hadn't said anything? What if you don't say something? In his plan for the salvation of the world, Almighty God has made the eternal destiny of other people contingent on you stepping outside your comfort zone and putting your love for that other person before you feeling comfortable and safe. Guys, that was not a moment where it was comfortable for me to rock the boat with an awkward discussion with Grandma about faith. I had to do it, even though it might upset someone. Even if it might upset her son, who's an agnostic. And here I am, this preacher boy. Even then, yes. There's no safe space in Christianity, guys. We follow a God who said, step out of that boat and stand on water with me. Lord, are you crazy? Yes, but the right kind. It's love that drives us. Keep first things first. Make real Christian friendships, small groups. Commit to that. Commit to it. By the way, if, you're, if you want a resource for that, if you text the word joy to the phone number 44144, or if you're from Boston, 44144, the word joy, you can get my uh, Living Joy program. It has 11 small groups. I got you covered for a, a year's worth of small groups. Or I recommend looking up the search. Just look up Christophanic Formed Search. Incredible. Seven episodes about the, the faith that no matter where you're at in the faith, it's going to touch you. And you just talk, you watch the video, and then talk about how it touched your heart and ask how you're doing before you watch the video. Three, don't let fear come in the way. Make it known that you're a Christian. And even if you don't have the time for that, or, or the, the opportunity for that deep discussion with a person on their deathbed, you're walking through the grocery store, you get change. Instead of saying thanks for the change, say, God bless you. Did I sneeze? No, I'm just a Catholic. It's those little things, but you've got to be intentional about doing it and saying, I'm, I'm okay being branded with this guy. Number four, do not give in to the spirit of cancel culture. Don't give in to the spirit of cancel culture. I was really challenged. I was preparing this talk, and I, and I heard a beautiful homily from a priest who, who said that, you know, he said, when I was a young priest and the initial scandal broke in 2002, 
He said some of his fellow priests were saying, those men who took advantage of children are monsters. And he said, I remember contemplating that and thinking, there's nothing in, in the Gospels that tells me I'm supposed to love a monster. And yet I'm supposed to love everybody. We like writing people off as if they're monsters. People do horrible, awful things sometimes, guys. But no human is a monster. I learned uh, not long ago that Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, went to confession before he died. And when I learned that, I was angry. How sad is that? I, my, my first gut response was, dang, that's not fair. No, it's not fair. The cross isn't fair. It's mercy. <laughs> but I brought that, that feeling to prayer and I just, I heard the Lord say to my heart, Chris, I worked all Ted's life to get him to that confession. Rejoice with me. <laughs> Guys, we live in a world that seems to be comfortable with, with hating Christians more and more. Even with violence more and more. A violence that, that no doubt will turn against Christians more and more. The apostles found themselves in a world like that. Their response was not to give into a spirit of us and them and I hate you. The world is, 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 is tearing apart at the seams right now. There was a study done recently that, that found that 80% of people who describe themselves as liberals hate conservatives. 80% of people who can describe themselves as conservative hate liberals. To just blindly side with one side and say, I'm on the conservative side. No, no, no I'm on the Christian side. We, we engage the issues of our age just like anybody else, but we should sound different when we do it. St. Paul was, it was in prison, in chains. And the people he saw as his prison guards, he knew any one of them, that might be the guy that chops my head off. That might be the guy that chops my head off. But he didn't hate them. He actually found himself thinking, that prison guard is exactly where I want him. Time to spread the gospel. And, and the scriptures tell us about how St. Paul was preaching the gospel constantly to the, to, to the prison guards. And because of that, talks about how members of Nero's household were converted. Why? Because he brought a spirit of love to the people who couldn't stand him. I think of the witness of Martin Luther King Jr. The Reverend. He's a preacher. He wasn't a secular humanist pushing an agenda for a get-even retribution kind of agenda. He was a preacher of the gospel. And his principle was radical love. Love your enemies. That doesn't sound very Christian to say that we have enemies, Chris. Okay. The Lord wouldn't have said love your enemies if we didn't have enemies. There are people who want to hurt you. Our response has got to be love. And I think of, I love Acts chapter 4. After they were scourged, Peter and John went back to the, to the Christian community. And I love this prayer. It really convicts me. They prayed together, Lord, take note of their threats. God, take note of their threats. All the injustice and the... The scales tipping against Christianity and this cancel culture garbage and all this stuff. Take note of their threats. And enable your servants to speak your word with all boldness. Give us courage in the face of the threats as you stretch forth your hand and smite them. Actually, that's not what it said. <laughs> that's not what they prayed. That's how we want to pray sometimes. Lord, take note of their threats and let's get even. No, no, no. As you enable your servants to speak your word with all boldness, as you stretch forth your hand to heal. Lord, give us courage in the face of persecution, in the face of cancer culture, in the face of people who can't stand you and don't like me just because I follow you, as you stretch forth your hand to heal them. You got to pray, man. The Lord says, Love your enemies. That's impossible without grace. Lord, give us grace to love our enemies. Number one, you want to you live like the first apostles and have the joy of spreading the gospel in the world, having the joy of seeing people's lives change? Well, number one, keep first things first. Be known as a person who talks about your relationship with Jesus. Let his name be on your lips. Jesus. Make time for people and build real friendship and real Christian community through small groups. That's number two. Number three, do not let fear come in the way. Number four, Resist the spirit of cancel culture. And finally, number five, pray as you do it. Pray as you share the faith. Pray like each day. Lord, give me the opportunity to share you with somebody today. 
open a door and give me the courage to walk through it. And then as you're sharing the faith, and I have conversations, man, every, every trip I go on, every Uber driver, you watch it if you're my Uber driver, right? I'm talking to you about Jesus. Everywhere I go, I'm looking for the open door, not in a forced, heavy-handed, awkward way, but in a natural, normal, human way. I'm just, you talk about how you're into football, I'm going to talk about how I'm into Jesus. Give me the words to say, because I don't know what this person needs to hear, but you do, so show me. And I think of Jesus, he had that advantage, obviously, of being divine, that he knew what each person needed to hear. And he, he went to the Pharisees, and they needed a challenge. He, they needed to hear him yell at them. You are like a whitewashed tomb. You're all dead bones on the inside. And then some people think, well, if you're going to be an evangelist, if you're going to share your faith today, don't be harsh with people. That's not like Jesus. Wrong. Wrong. You see, evangelization is not about you being liked. It's about what that other person needs because the motive isn't me doing it right. It's love for that person. And sometimes what that person needs is a straightforward challenge. More often we're going to find what people need is what Jesus gave Zacchaeus. An unconfident guy. No one liked him. He was a tax collector. He climbed a tree just to see Jesus and he stood at the base of the tree and said, Zacchaeus, you are like a tomb with dead bones on the inside. No, it's not what he said. He said, Zacchaeus, come on down. I want to have a beer at your house. I'm paraphrasing scripture right now. But it was something like that. Literally. I want to come over. And people criticized. He's going to the house of that sinner, the tax collector. And just because of that, that simple invitation to hang out, Zacchaeus stood his ground, gave back all the money he had, he had unjustly taken from people, and stolen from people, and began to follow Jesus. Total conversion. What does the person you're talking to need? Ask the Lord. Sometimes he might tell you very overtly. One of my dear friends is a, a traveling uh, evangelist, writer, and he was on his way home from a trip once, and he was exhausted after this weekend doing a long youth conference. And this guy was sitting next to him on the plane, and he looked at the guy, and he saw, miraculously, the, the word adultery written across his forehead in big black letters. And he said, Lord, really? Man, I want to take a nap. But if I look at this and see it again, I know I have to say something. And he looked, and it was still there. So he mustered the courage, and he said, Hey, uh, I don't know how to say this, but I can see the word adultery written across your forehead. The guy's jaw dropped, and he said, I'm on my way to see my mistress right now. They talked about the faith the entire flight to Los Angeles. The guy got off the plane, went to the ticket counter, and brought a ticket home. Sometimes the Lord will do that. He can show you exactly what a person needs. Usually, even though He can always do that, the Lord doesn't. Why? <laughs> can you make it easier for us? There's a reason He doesn't, guys. I'll tell you what the reason is. Why I think it is. Because He wants to put us in an uncomfortable situation where we are stretching our hearts to listen to the person in front of us who sometimes doesn't even like us because we stand with Jesus. And we're stretching our hearts and praying and listening to the Lord at the same time. And as we stretch our hearts and try to share the faith, who do we become more like? Just like Jesus on the cross. Guys, His end game for you is not just that you be an effective tool in His hand, but that you become more like Him. And that's why sharing your faith is not just for the spiritually elite or the full-time evangelist or the guy with a podcast. It's Christianity 101. It's for all of us. It's a part of how we become like our Lord. Our Lord who, driven by love, left the 99 to search for the one. Who ultimately, driven by love, put everything on the line and laid down his life for us. Jesus, give us that love for humanity and for you. Amen. Brothers and sisters, thanks so much for being with me. Lean into this, man. Share the faith with me. The world needs it. Your soul needs it. God bless you. Man, wasn't that great? Listen, if you don't want to be happy, be sure not to subscribe. But if you want a more joyful life, the kind of life that God created you for, the kind of life Jesus promised when he said, I came to give you life to the full, then make sure you hit subscribe and share this channel with everybody you know.